Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Responsible Alpaca Standard Launch. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also reposted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Any, any unanswered questions will be answered afterward via email. Now, on to Callie with Textile Exchange. Callie? Thanks so much, Rose. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Responsible Alpaca Standard Launch Webinar. We're really excited to be presenting um, the newest standard in the textile exchange portfolio today, and um, we'll be going over a lot of information, so I will jump right in. Antitrust statement, just for reference here. Um, our agenda today will start with a welcome and an intro, and then I will pass it off to my colleague Hannah, who will discuss um, some of the specifics about the standard and how it fits into our RAF framework of, of animal fiber. Um, we'll talk about certification, how farms can be certified, the supply chain and brand level cert certification, and then we'll get into the material for alpaca, um, the farming systems that exist, and some of the assurance solutions that we're working on with um, this standard specifically. We'll talk about animal welfare with alpaca and the impact potential for land management. And then we'll also get a supply update and hear about some engagement opportunities and um, some claims that can be made on um, the standard while the supply is being built. And then we'll end with some um, a good amount of time for question and answer. <clears throat> um, quick intro, if you have been involved in the revision process or any of our other animal fiber standards, you probably recognize this team. Um, we have Anna Heaton, and I'm really excited to introduce her as a member of Textile Exchange this time around. Um, she's joining us this summer as our senior manager for animal materials. We also have Hannah Deans, who's been working on the RAF standards for quite a while. Um, she's the senior manager of standards. And then myself, Callie Weldon, I'm the standards specialist, and I've been with Textile Exchange for the past two years working um, across the standards, but specifically with the animal fiber standards as well. And with that, I will uh, pass it off to Hannah to get us started on the breakdown of the, the standard. Great. Thank you very much, Callie. There you can go straight to the first slide. So uh, today's uh, webinar is to launch the Responsible Alpaca Standard, which is joining the Responsible Animal Fibre Standards to sit alongside the Responsible Wool Standard and the Responsible Moho Standard. And as Kelly said, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of the process that we've gone through to develop the standard and share a bit of information about how the certification will work, both at the farm uh, level as well as in the supply chain. But just for, for background, um, it's useful to just frame things that when the RWS was um, initially developed, we limited the scope to, to sheep only to make the standard development process manageable. But the intention was always there that it, we could build on it to create something broader. So when we started the process of developing the responsible mohair standard, we used the foundation that we had with the RWS, the desired outcomes and the principles that were established by that standard development process to create an animal welfare framework. We then use this as a compass to guide the development of the mohair standard to ensure that the two standards were as closely aligned as possible in terms of outcomes that the standards aim to deliver as well as where the thresholds are set. And this is uh, in brief, the process that we've gone through as well, we've replicated to create the responsible alpaca standard. So if you go to the next slide, please. So Textile Exchange is very pleased to say now a fully code compliant member of ICL and in terms of standard setting and revision, that means that we follow the ICL code of good practice for setting social and environmental standards. And if you've been involved in, in uh, any of uh, our development processes, you'll be familiar with uh, our in international working group approach. This process is evolving and it has worked a little bit differently with the development of the Responsible Alpaca Standard and uh, it's going to carry on evolving as we establish this uh, 
bed in this framework for responsible animal fiber standards. Uh, but uh, to put it simply, we bring together all of the responsible animal fiber standards, species specifics, working groups into one overall uh, RAF, International Working Group. Uh, so when we're revising a scope or developing a species specific scope, we're focusing only on the specific technical adaptations that are required to adjust for that species or the production system, all of the principles and the desired outcomes and the thresholds that have already been established remain the same. But going forward, we will now have one overall international working group across the different animal fiber standards. We'll still work on a species specific basis, but we will, uh, we have our next revision of the overall full framework is scheduled to take place in 2023. So if you are interested in uh, being involved or learning more about the process, do, do feel free to get in touch. But um, I can move to the next slide now. So one, one of the benefits of building on this sort of foundation means that it is a, a quicker than normal process when it comes to creating a, a standard. Um, so looking back at the, the process that we've been through, uh, I think it took just over a year from start to finish to create the responsible alpaca standard. But before we formally initiated the development in March last year, we did spend uh, a bit of work doing background, background research and, and development. But the um, first period of the standard development work was really focusing on uh, researching the alpaca industry and alpaca as an animal. So a lot of discussions and conversations with experts and the, the industry. And based on the findings from this research, we created the, the work program for the standards development. We then held a series of international working group meetings between June and November, where we worked through the draft standard topic by topic. And in addition to reviewing the technical details of each impact area that the standard addresses, we also looked, and this was a big piece of our work as well, was looking at the assurance system that we have for the standards and how this needed to be updated to uh, be suitable for the, the specific production context that, uh, of alpaca. And Anna is going to talk a bit more about uh, these assurance updates shortly. And as usual with uh, our standard development process, stakeholder, public stakeholder consultation is a, a very important part. So following the international working group review of the drafts, we've held public stakeholder consultations, uh, the last one prior to the launch of the, of the standard in, in April. So releasing the standard is definitely a very significant milestone, but our work is definitely not done. Kali is going to talk a bit more about the next steps in terms of what needs to happen to support the implementation of the standard. One key focus from the standard system and the certification perspective is order to training, but there are many more things that we can, can do to uh, help grow the standard. Next slide, please. So um, the, the front covers are obviously all different, but uh, the structure of the standard will be familiar to anyone that has uh, looked at the RWS or the RMS. Um, the standard follows, as I mentioned at the beginning, that is based on the animal welfare framework, uh, but we also take the same approach on land management and social welfare. So the same, um, uh, it follows the same structure and format and uh, where possible the requirements are as aligned as, as possible. We have also, uh, this is new from the updated version of the RWS and the RMS release, uh, 
got more chain of custody requirements for the farm level included within the standard itself. Once the fiber leaves the farm stage, the content claim standard takes over, but that's an area that we included a, a bit more detail in um, RWS v2, which is now also in the RAS. And another new introduction in RWS v2, which is in the RAS, is an optional slaughter module. And uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So if you want to get a very quick overview of the RAS and you don't want to read the full standard, I would recommend looking through the standard document and focusing in on the desired outcomes for each section, because that will give you a good understanding of what the standard is trying to do. For those that prefer a deeper dive, I would recommend looking at the user guide instead. As with the... Um, RWS and RMS user guides, there's uh, uh, the same, same structure. So the compass sections gives a little bit more detail on what the standard is asking for. And this is really important as the, these standards are written in a way to allow them to be applied globally in a range of different contexts, uh, which means that the standard requirements are often written in an outcome focused way. This provides flexibility, but it doesn't give the specific details. So the user guide is a good opportunity to provide that additional interpretation and examples. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, additional good practice uh, guidance and information and uh, tools and templates uh, and deeper dives into some of the, the key topics that the standard addresses. And uh, th this is a, a document that we will also be adding to as we work through the implementation. The next slide, please. So moving on to how the certification will work in, in practice, and we appreciate this. It's a, a bit complicated at the, at the first glance, but I'll, I'll try to, to explain it. But um, the RAF is the umbrella term for all of the animal fiber standards. At the farm level, certification still takes place for each species scope. So farm certification is either to the responsible alpaca standard, responsible wool standard, or the responsible mohair standard. Um, farms can become certified to more than one scope. This is something we see a lot in wool and mohair. Uh, where that happens, it should be very easy to combine the audits and there is uh, no additional scope certificate fees. So we can allow combined scope certificates there. The big difference really is once the material enters the supply chain. So supply chain sites are certified to the CCS with an RAF scope. That means that they're then able to process RWS, RMS and RAF materials. So for supply chain sites that are not yet certified, they can become certified to the CCS RAF scope immediately. Um, and existing uh, RWS or RMS supply chain sites have automatically been granted RAF scopes for this year. So they are also able to handle certified uh, alpaca fiber once that becomes available. So if we move to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to just give a little bit of context of the, the benefit of this uh, combining the scopes in, in the supply chain. Uh, this means that once the, there is certified fiber, we don't have to build uh, the supply, certified supply chains because they're already readily available. Uh, this is not yet finalized figures for 2020, so we will be updating them. We're still waiting on, on some data from um, some of our certification bodies, but uh, by the end of 2020, we had over 700 supply chain sites certified to the responsible animal fiber standards. This we've seen a, a consistent strong growth over the, over the years, and uh, in the 
in particular in the past year we've seen very strong growth both in in China and in Italy but um, it has been consistent growth across all key uh, production regions so if we go to the next slide please Another important piece of the puzzle of how, how it works is the logo use and claims. Um, we have a, a new standards claims policy that has introduced new opportunities for commitment claims and custom claims. And we're really excited about the possibilities that this would open up for supporting the implementation of the standard, in particular at the farm level, and Callie is going to share some more detail about that. But one, one important um, sort of uh, uh, logo use rule to be aware of is that whilst we have combined the scope in the supply chain, we are keeping labelling separate. So um, RAS certified product can contain non certified mohair and non-certified wool and other non-wool animal fibers and other materials, but it cannot contain non-certified alpaca fiber. So you can't mix with a conventional counterpart, but you can mix with any other fiber. So that's a really important rule to be aware of. This was a, a topic of quite some discussion in the international working group, uh, but the decision was made that we're keeping the, the claims separate for, for the time being to, to support the, uh, the adoption of the, of the standard and the, and the growth of, over time. So this is uh, something that could be revisited in the future when the supply picture looks, looks different. But for now, it's important to be aware that you can blend with, with other fibers and you can blend with non-certified mohair and non-certified wool as well. And um, just included here on the slides as well, the uh, email address to contact for any any questions regarding claims because we for we used to have standalone logo use and claims guides for each standard but that is now part of an overall standards claims policy that covers all of the textile exchange standards and uh, we have got so, some new possibilities there so uh, if you have any questions do reach out to claims at textile exchange and we can go to the next slide please Kelly So that was a, a quick overview of um, the process we went through to develop the uh, responsible alpaca standard and how the certification works. But before I hand you back to Kali, who's going to talk to you about alpaca supply chains, I will just finish by flagging some of the useful tools and, and resources that we have for supply chain certification. Uh, so first of all, we've got two different toolkits that give really good introductions to how our chain of custody system works for textile exchange standards. Um, and I've also included a snapshot of our certification body listings that you can find on our website. And a key change to flag is that uh, certification bodies that are accredited to the CCS scope, uh, they can certify the supply uh, content claim standard for any of our standards, apart from the, the GRS, which has got additional social, chemical and environmental criteria. So when you're looking at that listing and looking for a certification body, uh, look for one that is accredited to the CCS if it's for the supply chain certification. If it's for farm certification, you need to look for RAF. And last but not least, I also wanted to do a quick plug for the fact that we are in the final stages of revising the content claim standard. And there are some really exciting updates there, in particular at the post-production certification stage. So again, I'd uh, encourage you to visit the, the website to uh, learn more about that or keep an eye out uh, for more information in the Textile Exchange newsletter. And with that, I will hand you over to Callie. Thank you. Diana, um, so I just wanted to 
remind everyone that we don't have a chat function on this webinar. So if you do have questions, there's a question and answer box um, on your control panel that you can type questions and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, but now I'm going to dive into a little bit about the alpaca farming systems and the fiber characteristics of the material itself. Um, if you were with us for our intro to alpaca webinar way back last March, then these slides may be familiar, but um, I am a little biased. Alpaca is my absolute favorite animal and material, um, so I love kind of looking at the details about what makes up this kind of um, incredible soft fiber. Um, the alpaca fiber, it's bred in 22 natural shades, and there are such a range. I think there's over 300 different variants of um, color that you can get with the different um, natural fiber when it's sheared. So there's a lot of different options. Um, white or um, you know off-white is, is the most bred, the most popular because of its, its easiness to dye. Um, but with alpaca, it's very similar to sheep where one fleece of the alpaca will contain multiple diameters of fiber. Um, so when you hear somebody say uh, baby alpaca, the fine, um, fine alpaca, it's not actually a baby alpaca that's being sheared, although um, the first shear of an alpaca is, is considered to be the softest overall, but it's actually referring to the micron grade. So um, if you look at the, the different grades, and these vary depending on um, you know, what system you're using, what country you're, you're sourcing from, but overall, these are, are pretty much the, the ranges for the grades of the microns, and you can see that they're, they go really fine um, compared to other materials, just like wool. But, um, the most applicable micron for apparel is baby or fine. Um, you get into medium, strong, and mixed for some of the more tech or I guess um, construction uses or bedding uses. And then royal would be a really fine um, apparel item, like a scarf or something that was going to be sitting right on the skin. Um, it's very, very soft if you've ever felt it, less than 18 microns. Um, and then just to note that each time the alpaca is sheared, like many other animals um, that require shearing, the fiber diameter will increase slightly with that. Um, I'll leave this just for reference um, to come back to. I won't get into all of the technical details, but um, there's just some fiber characteristics and specs that I thought I would leave here for you. Um, and one of the most, um, I guess, in, not important, but one of the most interesting aspects of alpaca is that it's lanolin free. So it doesn't require the harsh chemical baths in the scouring phase to, to strip the lanolin and the processing. And it um, makes it hypoallergenic for many people who might be allergic to some animal fibers when they're wearing the apparel items. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's all I'll, I'll touch on this slide. Um, getting into production geography, so where alpacas are produced, uh, we have the most by far in Peru, 71.7%, and this is from a census that was taken um, in 2012, I believe, so it's a little bit out of date, but I'll get into why it's so hard to collect data in a minute here with the farming systems and how they're set up. Um, Bolivia has about 8.6% of the population, and then Australia, US, EU. There's been some other countries that have come out to say that they're looking to increase their population, such as China um, and the US as well. But by far, Peru is home to the majority of the alpaca, and um, it's around 6 million. So we're not talking about a huge number compared to other animals like sheep or, or goats, but um, within that 6 million, uh, the majority, almost 4 million of them are living in, in the Peruvian highlands. Um, so if you're familiar with Peru or South America and um, have visited and, and been to the mountainous regions, then you might, might have seen some alpaca. Um, they like to live at very high altitudes, about 12,500 feet or 3,800 meters above sea level. Um, in Peru or Spanish, this is called the Altiplano. And uh, the fiber characteristics of living at such a high altitude are really incredible. The, the fiber is responding to the environment that it's being put in. And so it's really strong, it's resistant, it's um, water, resi water resilient. So um, being bred at these really high altitudes actually is increasing the, the quality of the fiber that is coming off of these animals. Um, the main production areas are mostly in Puno and Cusco, some in Arequipa, but this map kind of shows the concentration all coming towards 
what would be Bolivia over here. And this is a very, very high altitude region of Peru. Um, there's a lake here, Lake Titicaca, that is the highest alpine lake in the world. And so most of the population of the alpaca will be here, but then you'll get some coming up the coast and um, up into the Cusco region as well. Um, and one of the most important aspects that I wanted to touch on, which is really uh, what we focused a lot on in our implementation discussions for the standard, is that most of the farmers that are producing alpacas are smallholder indigenous populations. So they own on average 46 alpacas. If you look at the breakdown um, with the chart that uh, the AIA, the Alpaca Association put together, it's, it's really the vast majority are owning a small amount of animals. So this, this presents unique challenges when we're talking about implementation of the standard just in terms of physical access to these areas because they are so remote, but then also just with the scale um, when we're working with communities, you know, the range of animals that we're targeting is going to need to be um, a much larger effort than just working with a couple, a couple of farms um, for the implementation. So we'll talk about some of um, the challenges with this and then some of the solutions that we've come up with in the implementation plan going forward. And with that, I will hand it off to Anna to get into some of the solutions and challenges. Thanks a lot, Callie. Yes, I, this uh, this point that Callie's just raised here that with um, uh, alpaca in, in Peru, where obviously the majority of alpaca are, that we have a, a large number of very small producers. We, we do have some of the same challenges with uh, some regions of production for wool and mohair. So really sort of as we were starting to work with alpaca, we, we already knew that we had to uh, work out how we manage these situations for, for all the responsible um, animal fibres. Um, we started uh, looking at what we're now sort of calling our communal farmer group module. And with the, the communal farmer groups, these are farmers with a with a range of difficulties to to overcome. So these tend to be people with significant economic constraints. They may have a lack of land tenure. Their um, overall um, the the income that they gain is is very dependent or almost solely dependent on these particular fibre animals. Uh, the amount that they they earn is quite often less than uh, could be possible with larger, you know, with different uh, commercial farm setups. So we sort of said, we've set up a framework to say, these are the kind of people that we, we want to be able to support and we still want to be able to um, certify them. Uh, and as I say, as Callie's just explained, this is a particular issue for alpaca in, in Peru, that we have this large number of very small producers that in between them are produ producing a, a high percentage of the total amount of the total volume of fiber that's coming out of Peru. But while we're talking about this being a, a communal farmer group module, we are, we are not changing the standards for communal farmer groups. But what we are doing is looking at how we actually assess those groups. So we've still got a need to demonstrate that the requirements of the responsible fibre standards are met, whether that is for alpaca, for wool or for mohair. But I say how we're doing it is, 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 the, is the, the sort of solution bit that we're going on. To. So if you can go to the next uh, slide, Kelly. Um, so with the with one of the things that comes up a lot with when we start talking about uh, multiple small scale producers and certainly in some of the regions and uh, 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 countries that we're talking about when we start looking at this across species there may be literacy issues as well it's just not reasonable to expect people to hold sort of detailed individual paper-based records so with the communal farmer groups we've we've done much more work looking at this at the group group level. So instead of each individual uh, communal group farmer or herder having to have their own animal welfare plan, for example, what we're doing is saying the group together would uh, collaborate, work together to identify the particular health and welfare challenges and develop that, that plan at the group level. It still needs to be delivered 
by those individual um, farmers and, and herders. Uh, but again, in terms of assessing whether those individual farmers and herders are, are, are doing the, the things that we require within the standard and delivering those outcomes, is we've got more of an emphasis on animal welfare outcomes. And we're using, this is a, a system, uh, the Animal Welfare Indicator System. This was something that was, uh, was not developed by Textile Exchange. It was, uh, it's a, it was a European project, uh, was mainly focused on uh, sheep and and goats but looking at how you can actually score animal welfare outcomes so rather than saying we're looking at what do we what are we giving the animal so uh, I'm giving the animal a, a certain amount of food or a certain type of food would be sort of a, an input or resource standard but when we start looking at well what's actually the body condition of this animal uh, what sort of state of health is it in that's looking more at the the outcomes from what the uh, what the farmer has um, provided so with the communal farmer groups for both the um, the uh, animal welfare and animal health uh, plans that are required within RWS and also the land management and biodiversity planning and management uh, that are required within the, um, the RAS. Uh, we're, we're looking at doing that at a group level and we're providing uh, templates uh, for groups to that they, they can choose to follow to support them as they develop those those plans. And then with this outcome assessment, it is partly being done so the uh, this is something that we would say we again we're providing guidance on how to do this and what to score so within the group the um the 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 herders or farmers will need to be familiar with what's being assessed but from an audit point of view uh, the farms and herders that are chosen for a third party audit uh, would have these animal welfare indicator system protocols carried out by the third party auditors. And there's two parts to that. One of it is a, is a group assessment. So that's sort of looking at the, the uh, 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 that might be the whole herd if we're talking about alpacas when there's very small numbers in, in total or might be a, a subsection of a herd or flock. And then there's a sample of individual animal assessments uh, which will cover topics like body condition scoring, lameness, injuries and things like that. So it's, it's sort of building this uh, system that allows us to uh, show that the, um, the responsible animal fibre standards are being met, but it's just being assessed slightly, slightly differently. We can go to the next slide. And we have uh, done a pilot on this, um, though the pilot was actually carried out on uh, with, with, with wool. Uh, as I said at the start of this, this is something we know is across different species, even though um, it, with alpaca it's particularly pertinent. But uh, we, uh, amazingly, I, I think uh, both the, uh, the, the, the auditors and the uh, textile exchange uh, people uh, did an, a fabulous job of being able to arrange um, visits to see uh, the semi-nomadic and nomadic sheep farmers in India to test and trial uh, the, uh, the communal farmer module, do it as a, as a pilot. Um, overall, there was a, a very positive outcome. There was the, the, um, the, the groups and the individual herders were very pleased to be engaged with and keen to be part of uh, the project. And there was some useful feedback that we will take forward as we refine this communal farmer module to, so that we can move on and, and use it for all these species. And again, particularly for alpaca on things like like the sample sizes so having said there is a, a sample of individual animals it's that balance of sampling enough animals that we're confident that the scoring we get is representative of that herd or flock but not sampling so much that it's taking an entire day to do an audit of a, of a relatively small herd or flock so we feel that this is a, a good way forward uh, as we move into certification with the small scale alpaca farmers in Peru. But there is going to need to be some support to train and organize the farmers on the requirements of the responsible alpaca.
alpaca standard and having said that we are moving some of the record keeping up to the the group level there still needs to be that support for how to how do the group function how do the farmers come together uh, to discuss these points about land management and animal health and, and how is that captured as well but we feel that we've got a good pathway to uh, move move forward on that so that's sort of I, I, I hope that is a it's a positive way forward and we'll we'll obviously see how we um, how, how we can refine that following our, our initial um, pilots. But I'm going to move on now, uh, Callie, if you can advance that and go straight to the next slide. That's that's fine. Just to talk in a bit more detail about um, animal welfare and what we've been doing with the responsible alpaca standard. And Hannah, at the beginning of this talk, uh, obviously laid out the fact that we're, we're looking at everything comes back through the animal welfare framework, where we have these specific modules to cover the sort of main topics around animal management and welfare and we have desired outcomes for that but it's almost in some ways i'm sort of taking a, a, a sort of saying well where did all this come from and, and where did what how does it actually apply in practice uh, and one thing i want to talk about was the the welfare principles and the the five provisions which are sometimes called the five domains a lot of people are familiar with the five freedoms. Uh, this is a concept that's been around for uh, quite a long time. Uh, and this is a, a cross cutting, cross species um, a set of principles about how, if we're farming animals, what, what we should be doing. But a lot of the five freedoms are really about avoiding the negative. It's 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 you know this animal you must they must not um, be be have, uh, suffer from hunger or thirst. They must not suffer from fear or distress. So it's saying bad things must not happen, the, but doesn't really go much further than that. Whereas the five provisions are much more framing this in the context of we actually need to go beyond that. We need to look at the promotion of, of positive experience and positive welfare for the animals. So as an example here, I've said this isn't just prohibiting poor handling that could cause distress or injury to the animal, but actually promoting positive interactions between the, the handler, the stock person and the animal that they're, that they're handling. So as we have been uh, working on the responsible alpaca standards, we have been trying to, to bring that, that, uh, those principles into play. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide, Callie. So this is, again, this is a sort of one, there's a sort of, I'm, I'm not going to go through every single aspect of this, but it's, again, it's looking, you have still got these sort of five key topics and provisions, but as I've said, this is more about the sort of balance between uh, the negative and, and the positive. So within, within each of these topics, there are things that could be uh, giving a, a, a negative outcome to the animal, but equally there's some, some positive examples as well. And what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we're, we've got some requirements that are moving us into the, the, the positive stage. And the other thing with the five provisions is we've got this sort of greater emphasis really on the on the mental state of the animal. So these the nutrition, hydration, environment, health status and behaviour, really the sort of um, outcomes from from those four provisions feed into the provision on on mental state, uh, because, you know, for each of these things, you could say for nutrition and hydration, if there is restricted food, the animal is is hungry, then that's going to have a negative uh, imp mental impact as well. If the animal is, is has got that feeling of hunger uh, and not not having access to sufficient food. Or, or water so they these things are are all interlinked but it says just trying to show that this is this is how we're trying to move forward with with the standards uh, in terms of delivering these positive outcomes for for farmed um, animals and I think if we go on to the next slide we'll come into sort of some examples of where with alpacas we've really had to look at things um, because the situation with alpaca is it's perhaps slightly differently different to species that we're already uh, certifying so shearing obviously with all fiber animals there is uh, we have to shear them we need to remove the fiber uh, and that we know that shearing is 
uh, can be a, a risk time for, for animal injury. Uh, it's also a time when animal handling needs to be uh, done very carefully. These animals are much more closely in contact with humans at this time. Uh, and as I say, you know, there's the, just the, the skill and the requirements of the shearers to be competent and understand how to, to handle, handle the animals. And we could say that that is across all the fiber species that, uh, that that are being certified through the responsible animal fibers but alpacas are, are quite different to sheep or goats there's different challenges to handle and restrain them they're a, they're a much larger animal for for, for starters um, and there is when we're looking at what's happening in um, uh, Peru there is still some use of, of hand shearing uh, though some of the larger companies have teams of trained shearers uh, complete with a, with generators to power the clippers and will travel out to these small farms and will use the uh, electrically powered clippers to, to shear the alpacas. But the, the restraint that's required uh, in order to do this safely so the animal does not struggle and that reduce the risk of animals getting injured during the shearing process. We, we've had to come into how are we actually managing this? How are we minimizing the amount of time the animal is restrained? How are we framing that process of restraint uh, and how that is actually how that is actually done. So in the uh, responsible alpaca standard, the this shearing section is, is, is expanded from what you would see with the responsible wool or responsible mohair. Um, so there's there's, there are these uh, very specific alpaca specific requirements on how do you handle these animals? And, you know, for example, there must always be two people uh, to handle each animal, whereas with uh, sheep and goats, you can have one person shearing. Uh, how is this animal actually restrained? Uh, what are we what are we talking about in terms of, you know, even down to the, the ropes that might be uh, holding holding the animal uh, while it is going through the shearing process? And then in the user manual, and again, as, as Hannah mentioned, the user manual has uh, some of this is what we call this sort of compass guidance, which says, well, we have the standard that says these are things you must or must not do. The compass guidance gives a bit more detail on, on the expectation of how that would be delivered. And then the, uh, the, the light bulb uh, air section has, has more detail, again, sort of guidance and good practice. So we've, we've given that information, we've sort of given more, more detail in that user manual on things like the expected time, what's, what's a reasonable time to, to restrain and shear uh, an animal and, and, and just more detail on how that uh, whole process uh, should, go, should go ahead. Uh, and then the, take the next slide, please. And then the next sort of interesting one for uh, alpacas is uh, living environment. So again, we can say this is the same principle as we have for sheep and goats, which is that uh, all animals must be protected from extreme heat or cold. So they mustn't have therm be under a state of thermal stress. Um, with alpacas, as, as Callie pointed out, you know, we're, we've got animals at, at high altitude uh, and with the with the farms, uh, when you go and visit these farms, it, it's rare to find fenced enclosures. It, it's not like the sort of man, more managed landscapes that you can find with with sheep and goats where there's defined uh, paddocks or pastures that are uh, managed in a particular way and, and animals move from one to the next. With alpacas, it's much more in this very very open landscape where the alpacas may be herded to particular areas, but you, you're not tending to find these sort of fenced areas. Alpacas are adapted to live in these uh, environments and therefore most alpaca farmers don't have the sort of roofed barn or shelter that again you might see on a, a commercial uh, and again not necessarily all but some commercial sheep or goat farms would have these sort of uh, more sort of uh, a structure like you know a, a farm barn what you do get and you can see it in the photo is these stone walled pens uh, which can provide a, a shelter or windbreak and sometimes used for 
uh, holding animals in, in, in stormy weather or overnight. And we're still, what we're saying is that this is quite a different type of shelter than we might find with, with other species. But the, the standards on what we want to be delivered by that shelter, that it needs to be a stable structure that's not uh, potentially going to cause risk of injury to the alpacas. It needs to provide protection from the weather that could cause uh, a, a risk of welfare, uh, risk to welfare. And then we've also got these points, uh, again, you might be able to see the, uh, there's a, a alpaca in the a brown, dark brown alpaca wearing a black coat. So it might not be the easiest, but within the photo there, there's actually sort of use of coats for individual animals. So again, that might be quite a different thing when a, a flock of sheep is quite often managed as that, as that flock, even though there may be subgroups within that plot, flock that are managed slightly differently for with different risks so use with newborn lambs might be managed in a slightly different way than than weathers but with alpacas this is really almost getting to this is this these individual animals that the breeders are assessing need this extra support like like a coat so that's sort of again can be part of delivering this outcome of of ensuring the animals are in uh, good thermal comfort uh, and then the next one, please. And then this is just a couple of other standard points that have, have come up. So with alpaca teeth uh, may need to be rasped or trimmed. That's not something we've come across with sheep and goats. So we've had to make sure that we cover this again in the standards. Uh, and again, with guidance on how that is done in a way that, that protects welfare. Uh, and then topics that are the same across all species like castration, but actually the anatomy of alpacas is quite different. So the requirements around castration and the age at castra which castration is carried out are quite different. Um, as it happens, castration is quite rare in, in Peru. It's, it's not a, with, with sheep and goats in a, in a lot of landscapes, castration would be very common and the vast majority of males would be castrated at young age. It, it's not the same thing with alpacas. There seems to be uh, more of an ability to, to manage the animals without needing to castration, castrate them. Uh, and then nutrition, uh, the picture at the top, these sort of very low growing uh, types of vegetation. It's not a it's not a lush pasture in the uh, in the, the these high altitude areas of Peru. But again, the alpacas are, are well adapted and we're seeing, you know, there's diff there might be different types of vegetation, a different species of plants. But we're still looking at the same metrics of is body condition score being uh, being maintained uh, for. Or alpacas. So I'll just uh, summarise with the with the next slide that um, with with the animal welfare. I mean, I've sort of just run through a few sort of um, alpaca. Uh, challenges and, and how we're addressing those in, in standards or challenges and differences and how we're addressing those in standards. But we feel that really what we're looking at with alpaca is we have got a system with a high animal welfare potential. Uh, and those are systems where we've got uh, the, the, the husbandry can meet the animal's needs. Uh, the, the system of management provides for behavioral freedoms. There's no compromise on, on animal health. And we're really feeling that the alpaca in the highlands of Peru is an animal that's well adapted to its environment. It's very extensive and free ranging. So the responsible alpaca standards ensure that that high welfare potential is realized. And these audited standards uh, will ensure best practice from the farmers and deliver the good welfare for the alpacas. Uh, so thanks, uh, just a slight whistle stop tour of animal welfare. I'm just gonna hand back to Callie just to wrap up on this topic with uh, land management. Thanks, Anna. Um, just to pick up directly where Anna left off, I wanted to touch on some of the land management impact potential because um, the alpaca farming system being in the highlands and the Altiplano, it has a really high um, impact potential for grazing, for um, biodiversity, soil health, and just healthy land management practices. Uh, the land management module we introduced with the RWS and the RMS launch, and we're hoping to build on that each year as we get um, more and more involved in these areas of work. Um, I'll plug the animal fiber roundtable at the end of this, but we're hoping that this work evolves and um, the aspect of alpaca to realize this potential for the land impact um, is very high. Alpaca is just to mention um, one 
area that's that shows really high potential is they have soft padded feet so they don't have hooves they actually have nails um, so when they graze and when they walk on the land it does not necessarily create bare ground which doesn't have as many erosion problems um, another example to the right in the picture is um, from one of our implementing partners, Kopi Khan. They've implemented a seed programming for dry season grazing where um, you can see the land on the right has been seeded. The land on the left is the typical dry season land and the cultivated grasslands is just um, incredible, the, the yield that they received. So this helps with overgrazing with some of the herds that they're managing. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but more to come with land management in general. And if you're interested in this specific topic, um, I'll mention the Animal Fiber Roundtable at the end of this, which we'll be diving into some of these um, overarching pasture-based impact areas that, that Textile Exchange will work on with our Climate Plus strategy. Um, but moving along into our supply update, which I know a lot of suppliers and brands and retailers are super interested in where we're at with this. So during the revision process for the RAS draft, we had uh, a lot of implementing partners. We had a specific farming group that worked with us during the revision to start to align their internal procedures to match the requirements of the standard. So we do have some groups that are already ready and applying for certification. We've received two implementation proposals for five-year supply build plans. And if you're on our um, our RAF IWG call or part of the IWG, you've heard some details about these plans and, and what the, the goals are, but this would cover about 80% of farmers in, over the next five years. Um, the industry association, which is known as a SCALPE or AIA, is forming, um, with the help of Textile Exchange, a board of advisors, which will essentially help with funding and an adoption strategy and industry collaboration, um, which is something that is, is needed for this specific implementation. And then we're also um, building a funding mechanism. Uh, Anna mentioned the communal farming solution. And one of the biggest uh, barriers to entry is just funding um, on the ground, capacity building, veterinary training, um, really just spreading the word, running radio campaigns, reaching these farmers in these remote areas. So we're building a funding mechanism um, to be piloted with the RAS this summer. And then we're trying to expand that scope over the entire RAF with the wool farming and um, some goat pilots as well, and we're hoping to launch that officially this fall. Um, as Hannah mentioned earlier, on-farm RAS certification can begin now. We're finalizing the certification procedures with some of these updated communal farming aspects, and it should be released this month. Um, and then again, RAF supply chain certification can happen anytime from now on. So where does that leave brands and retailers that um, are looking to still incorporate alpaca fiber into their portfolio and want to get started immediately? I think that's a question we get a lot from brands and retailers is, when can I have certified supply? How can I start to talk about this to my customers? So I've essentially built out this little chart. Well, chain of custody is something that we're, you know, needs to be built up. It won't be available immediately as farms get certified, as supply becomes built up. Um, you can have options for communicating with your customers before the full chain of custody is built. So here, there's just a um, table that I've put together with some different options. General marketing claims are always available, no approval needed, um, a list of places you can put these. You can always use the logo for this and you can do it immediately. Um, same with commitment claims. If you haven't already made a commitment claim publicly and you're looking to engage with the RAS, you can communicate your commitment to sourcing um, the material from the standard. There's a recipe in our standards for, um, claims policy that lists out exact language that you can use and you just have to fill out a commitment registration form on our website. You don't need CB approval. Uh, we will approve it and release it and you can do that now as well. And then um, the most exciting for this specific standard implementation is a custom agreement based claim. So I'm going to dive into some of the details about this, but this is essentially a custom claim for your brand that would be worked out with textile exchange. It wouldn't be on product, but it would be a general marketing claim that's available based on a financial agreement that you've made to pledge towards the communal farming implementation. So I'll dive in. Um, Oh, this is just the link for the public facing commitments registration form and kind of some examples of what you could say. Um, but going back to the custom claims with resource commitment. So 
we're there's like I mentioned, there's a lot of funding needs for this communal farming model. There's financial matching programs that we're working on through the industry association, a scalpe or AIA. And there's the option for a custom and unique claim with logo that are um, allowed based on this agreement for financial support. So financial support would be allocated towards capacity building, implementation programming, veterinary visits, um, standard awareness campaigns, and a lot of other um, on the ground needs that um, can speed up adoption and can speed up supply. So if you are a brand or retailer looking for this type of engagement, looking for this type of claim and storytelling and to invest in the farm supply in general, please reach out. You can reach out directly to me. Um, we're still building the framework of what, uh, how these funds will be allocated, like I mentioned, and we're trying to pilot it this summer, but reach out to get involved. Um, I think this is a really exciting update in our standards claim policy that allows brands to start to take action before the full chain of custody is available. Um, Lastly, just some next steps. I mentioned the animal fiber roundtable. Um, we have a lot more information um, coming on this, but essentially it's the previous cashmere roundtable and the previous wool roundtable combined. We're going to be looking at um, more landscape-based cross-cutting areas of work. So it's not just wool and cashmere, but any sort of um, you know, animal fiber um, group that was gathering before wants to join can also participate in this. So we have our first kickoff call May 26th and we would love to have you there. You can register with that link. And then again, the link for the commitment claim. Um, but we have five minutes left. So I just wanna check the Q and A cause it looks like there's a lot of questions coming up. Um, let's see where I'll start. Um, who of the Peruvian alpaca suppliers have been involved in the IWG? Um, so we've had quite a few, I'm not sure if um, that's referencing producers or suppliers, but um, the Escalpe, the International Alpaca Association has been involved in the process for the revision. And then also um, the two large processors in Peru have been partners in this for the entirety from the research to the development phase. We've also been working with uh, the group that you saw pictured in the supply update, Copicon, they're a cooperative of about 2,000 farmers. And then individually, we've had about, I would say, 15 individual regional groups that have reached out wanting to start to implement the project as well. And we're very open to you know, continuing to recruit. As I mentioned, the industry is quite um, fragmented and small. And so the more, we, the more people we can bring to the table, if there are contacts that would like to get involved, please reach out. Um, let's see. Does the RAS provide training to farmers? That's a really great question. And it's something that um, in the past, our standards haven't necessarily provided on ground, on the ground training and um, the implementation process has looked different. Um, but for the RAS in particular, this is an area that we really are trying to help facilitate, even though textile exchange does not necessarily um, conduct on the ground work. We're trying to figure out mechanisms and ways to provide support in the on the ground training, whether it's bringing together the groups for the board of advisors with a scalp a, or whether it's um, looking for ways to match funding for developing these programs on the ground. Um, and if there's other suggestions and, and ideas for collaboration in that sense, then we're, we're, we would love to have that feedback. Let's see. Where will the pilot for the RAF communal farming model be implemented? Um, Hannah or Anna, do you wanna talk briefly about some of the other areas that have been interested in this? Uh, yes, sure, I can, I can jump in there. So we uh, conducted the initial pilots in, in India on, on wool. And uh, what we're doing now is we will evolve the, the the model and uh, try it out in, in in other regions and we've been having discussions with uh, um, South Africa in particular where we have both uh, wool and and mohair and um, we'll, we'll work on continually uh, improving the the approach as we're as we're able to I don't know if you want to add a little bit more Anna around the the training program planned for the certification bodies and auditors around the animal-based assessment that will contribute to all the scopes. 
Yes, no, again, just it, exactly as you said, Hannah, so we, and, and as I mentioned in the presentation, we, we know we've got, um, uh, we've, we've got this in different, different regions, uh, as Hannah was saying, sort of communal farmers and wool farmers in, in South Africa, uh, potentially um, one of the, the areas we could, we could do work. But yeah, um, with the feedback from uh, the, the auditors in, uh, for, the, for this, this small, sort of smaller Indian uh, pilot, wool pilot, uh, we are pulling together, yeah, training for the, for the auditors because again this is something if we're going to say that these assessments for responsible animal fibers a lot of this is being done on uh, outcome assessments we need to make sure that um, that the auditors are are confident that they understand when we you know what what the scoring systems are what's acceptable what's not acceptable so we'll we will be um, uh, moving forward with with that fairly soon Thanks, Anna. And I think that touches on somebody asked if auditors need specific accreditation to certify under the RAS. And um, Anna mentioned some of those particulars with the communal model. And then um, in general, our on farm scopes require some on farm auditing experience and handling. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to answer this one question is textile exchange considering setting up or collaborating with any partners for direct to farm sourcing models that brands could join in on. Um, so the direct funding model that I was mentioning with um, the communal funding really is our solution for this. There's not really a, a potential or a model that is available for um, direct sourcing just because of how fragmented the farmers are and how far away they're living from each other, how um, non, um, there's not a lot of regional organization with the farmers to bring them together, but um, in putting together this board of advisors and matching funds directly to these groups that are applying, um, there's the ability to just really know a lot more about the groups that are actually being certified, um, which I think is a great view into the supply chain that hasn't previously been there, where there's going to be able to, um, you know, data sharing allowed, be able to actually know where the fiber might be coming from in some cases, or know exactly what you're funding, at least to get into the supply. Um, so potential for the future for direct farm, farm matching, but um, with the industry where it is right now, the funding model through the industry association is um, the best thinking on it right now. So please reach out if you're interested in that. Um, and with that, I know that we're a minute over time and there's some questions that have been unanswered, but we will email and follow up directly with that and I'll hand it back to Rose. Great. I want to say thank you to everyone um, who participated today. I'd like to say thank you to our speakers. And um, just as a friendly reminder that um, today's webinar uh, will be sent out to, or the links to today's webinar and presentation will be sent out to all those who registered. And that concludes our webinar today. Thank you. Goodbye.